Hi everyone. I hope this video is bright enough. It looks a little dim, but every light in the room is on. There's not much else I can do about it at this point. So here we go. I've always had too vivid of imagination. I could walk down on a wharf carrying my daughter when she was a baby and I could see myself tripping and dropping her into the ocean. I mean, I could visualize it happening and it would make me feel physically ill. I tried to read an article once called A Physician's Description of the Crucifixion of Jesus, and I couldn't finish it. It was so horrifying to read the intense physical suffering of the cross. What Jesus went through on that Passover Friday is dreadful beyond comprehension, and the physical suffering is just the beginning. But there is so much going on in the description Matthew gives us of the events of the day we call Good Friday. It is a good day because it was the day God planned, the day he had made in which he would redeem mankind. But it was also a terrible, dark, horrifying day in its events, in the suffering, loss, loneliness, and judgment. Then it leads to the day of ultimate triumph and glory and of the rebirth of all our hopes. That Friday is hard to talk about and it's hard to read about, but it is the day the Lord has made. And we rejoice in it for all the good that it does for us. The book of Matthew has been full of references to all the ways the life and work of Jesus fulfill the prophecies of the Old Testament. Matthew is set on showing us that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the one God himself come to live among people and suffer for our sins. And he continues to do the same thing in his description of the suffering of the end of the life of Jesus and of his death. Now we should be starting in verse 32, but I realized I didn't cover verses 27 to 31 in the video last week. I'm not sure how I did that. So I just wanna spend a couple of minutes on these verses before we move into the section of questions covered by this lesson. The events of this Friday began in the darkness of the night when Jesus was arrested and tried before the high priest and then before Pilate. Once Pilate turned Jesus over to be crucified, he was in the hands of the soldiers who were allowed to do virtually anything they wanted with a condemned person. Verses 27 to 31 do not include everything that was done to Jesus. Other gospels include different details. Perhaps all the gospels combined don't include everything that happened to him in those hours. But Matthew includes some things that fulfilled past prophecies and point to future glories of Jesus. The entire band of soldiers are gathered together. Some sort of mob cruelty took over. There may have been a, this may have been a common practice with them when it came to those condemned, although they tailored their ridicule of Jesus to what they knew about him, and they began to mock him. And this mocking was predicted in Psalm 22, verse 7. They stripped him of his clothing and put on him a scarlet robe, and they put a crown on his head mocking his claim to be the king of the Jews. The crown was made of thorns. They gave him a pretend scepter. This humiliation of Jesus will be countered by God one day when we will see Jesus coming with a golden sash and white robes and crowned with many crowns and carrying the scepter of righteousness. They bowed before him pretending to honor him as king, but with mocking, this would have been difficult to take for one who had been worshiped by all the host of heaven for all eternity. But someday God will replace this humiliation with the moment that every knee will bow before Jesus, either willingly or by force. They shouted, hail King of the Jews again in ridicule. But someday every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. They struck him with the staff they had given him and jeered at him further. Someday he will strike his enemies with the sword of his mouth and rule with a rod of iron. And then when their fun was done, they took him away to crucify him. The other gospels tell us that he was flogged. This was a terrible suffering in which a leather whip of many strands was used. The strands were embedded with bits of bone to, and metal to inflict terrible wounds and great blood loss would result. Many criminals did not make it to the crucifixion for the flogging itself killed them. Isaiah 53, 5 tells us these wounds were for our healing. This flogging left Jesus extremely weak and bleeding heavily. That is not recorded in Matthew, but it contributes to what happened in Matthew 27, 32. A condemned person must carry their crossbeam, the crossbeam on which they would be crucified, out to the place where it would be attached to the upright. 
But often the condemned could not manage it since the flogging almost killed them. And so the Romans would, could compel a passerby to carry the cross beam. And Simon of Cyrene was conscripted to carry the cross of Jesus. Just as a side note, the Gospel of Mark in, verse, in chapter 15, verse 21, tells us this, this Simon from Cyrene is the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, this might be the Rufus mentioned in Romans 16, 13 as a believer in the church in Rome. So perhaps this event in the life of Simon resulted in his salvation and that of his family. The soldiers took Jesus to a place outside the walls of the city. This is very significant in showing us and the people of the time just who Jesus is. If you looked back at Leviticus 4 verses 12 and 21, you will see that the sin offering from the Day of Atonement was carried outside the camp to be burned. The blood was carried into the most holy place and put on the altar to atone for the sins of the people. Jesus being crucified outside of Jerusalem is a sign of his place as the sacrifice for sin that would atone for the sin of all mankind. Jesus was nailed to the cross. Another detail not included in Matthew. Psalm 22 describes the terrible thirst, the dislocated bones, and the stretched muscles of crucifixion. Crucifixion was full of terrible sights and dreadful humiliation. Matthew records in fulfillment of Psalm 61, 29, that Jesus was given wine to drink. Now this would not have been thirst quenching. It was mixed with gall, that is myrrh. It had sedative properties. It was not given as an act of mercy, but it made the prisoner more compliant so that they did not fight crucifixion as much. But as a sedative, it did reduce pain. So Jesus refused to drink it. He had to suffer all the pain of the cross in full payment of sin. He submitted to this suffering in order to pay the price of our rebellion against God to pay for our pride and self-will, our rejection of good, our love of evil. And so he rejected anything that would take away his ability to feel the pain, all of it. Pilate wrote a sign that was put over the head of Jesus. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. The religious leaders were against this. They wanted Pilate to write something different, but he refused. It was in fact a true declaration of who Jesus is. The crowds, those who passed by and saw this scene, they shouted insults at Jesus and mocked him. Even the two thieves crucified on either side of him ridiculed him. It's hard to understand why they would waste what little breath they had to ridicule Jesus. Perhaps it made them feel less terrible about their own condemnation. And we know that one of them changed his tune along the way and believed in Jesus. The crowd said he saved others, but he cannot save himself. If he comes down from the cross, we will believe him. After all, he said he is the Son of God. Now, in truth, Jesus could have come down from the cross. He could have avoided it altogether if he'd wanted to do so. But if he did, if he came down off the cross, he could save himself. He would save himself, but then he could not save us from the judgment of our sin. To save us, he had to sacrifice himself. His dedication to that, even at the cost of his own life, and this overwhelming pain is proof that he is the promised Messiah and is in fact the Son of God. In verse 45, the suffering of Jesus moves from simply the physical pain and public humiliation, as terrible as that was, to deep spiritual suffering. So, mm, let's see. Twenty-seven forty-five. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At noon, in a bright, warm climate, it got dark. Some people have said that this is perhaps some sort of eclipse, but an eclipse lasts only a few minutes. This darkness lasted from noon until three o'clock. This is a supernatural event. Darkness often refers to sin and evil and judgment, to separation from God. This darkness came down over the scene of Jesus' crucifixion as God put the judgment of sin on his son. All the cost of all the evil of all time landed on him. And in that darkness, his worst suffering 
took place. God separated himself from his son as he made his perfect son, the God of heaven, to be considered sin itself on our behalf. The father-son relationship between them was broken for that period of time. And after three hours of darkness, time in which Jesus suffered the loss of his relationship with his father and was punished spiritually for our sin, he cried out. This is verse 46. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, he did not say, my father, but my God at this time. And God was not acknowledging Jesus as his son in this moment, but he is still his God. And however, he has forsaken Jesus in order to punish him for our sin. People didn't understand what he was saying, or they misheard. Some of them thought he was calling for Elijah, and others decided to bring him a drink of vinegar on a, on a sponge stuck on a stick. And then they just simply waited to see what would happen. Verse 50 says that Jesus cried out again. Matthew does not record the words, but John tells us in John 20, verse 30, that what he said was, it is finished. This is a cry of victory. As difficult as it has been, he has done it all, stuck by the plan that God made, completed the work of redemption. Luke tells us of another thing he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Luke 23, 46. With the work done, with the price of our sin paid in full, once again, Jesus refers to God as his father. And then in verse 50, Jesus gave up his spirit. Notice it doesn't say he died. Death during crucifixion was usually by suffocation. It usually took a long time, sometimes three days to come. Jesus did not succumb to the slow process of crucifixion. He sent away his spirit by an act of his own will. I can't do that. I don't think you can. He can, because he's God. In the moment of his death, a number of overt and powerful signs that this was all the work of God were seen and felt by those in Jerusalem. The curtain in the temple, which divided the holy place from the most holy place, was torn apart. It was a thick, heavy, woven, embroidered curtain. They said it was as thick as the palm of a man's hand and it was torn from the top down. An unseen set of hands grabbed it at the top and tore it apart. This curtain had barred people from the presence of God. Anyone who went into the most holy place except the high priest on the Day of Atonement carrying the blood of sacrifice would immediately die. And now God himself tore open the curtain, opening the way into the presence of God for anyone who believed in Jesus. The curtain was no longer relevant. There was also a massive earthquake. This reminds me of the earthquake on Mount Sinai when God came down on the mountain to meet Moses and give him the Ten Commandments. It signifies the presence of the holy and almighty God. And in verse 52, it says, Graves were opened and many holy people were raised to life. They came out of the tomb after the resurrection of Jesus and were seen by many. Now, in fact, this resurrection of these people happened when Jesus rose from the dead. But Matthew puts it here so that we will see that it is as a result of the death of Jesus for our sin. There was a Roman centurion who saw all these things happen. And he saw the dignity of Jesus in the face of the mockery. He heard his cries to his father. He saw the darkness and the earthquake. And he came to the conclusion that the righteous, religious, self-righteous religious leaders had missed. And he said, surely he is the son of God. The final verse of this section tells us of a small group of loyal women who loved Jesus and who stood at a distance watching his crucifixion. They must have felt great sorrow and distress at his death. But they too saw the earthquake, the darkness, the cry of, it is finished. Of all the people in Jerusalem who had the chance to believe, it is this little band of women and a Roman centurion who understood. The Son of God endured separation from his Father to reconcile us to God. The death of Jesus was terrible. In human suffering, it is the stuff of nightmares. In spiritual suffering, it is beyond human understanding. But it's not a defeat. 
It was a carefully constructed plan to demonstrate to the universe not only the identity of Jesus as God the Son, but also to put his lavish love on display. Not one moment of this terrible Friday was an accident, and at no point was Jesus an unwilling victim. Sin is any thought, word, or action that does not put God first, that does not acknowledge him for who he is. It separates us from God, and Jesus died to restore that broken relationship to us. To do so, his own relationship with his Father had to be broken for a time. Sin carries a penalty, judgment, separation from God forever. That may not sound so bad, but there are only two possible final destinations when life is over. To be with God or to be in a place prepared for Satan and the, his demons. Those are the only two kingdoms that exist spiritually. And so we belong to one or the other. We suffer or enjoy the final end of the one to which we belong. As believers, the fact that the penalty of sin is paid for, for us by Jesus means we do not have to live under the power of sin. We can live free of it. When we fail as believers, and we do, our fellowship with God can be damaged. But Jesus died so it doesn't have to stay damaged. We confess and God forgives because Jesus restored our broken relationship with God by his death. In what sin or failure do you need restoration today? Now, beginning in verse 57, we read the account of the burial of Jesus. This is not often considered very significant to us believers who know the story, but it does play a crucial role in God's demonstration of his plan of salvation. The burial of Jesus had to happen hurriedly. By the time he died, it was after 3 p.m., and but prior to sunset, which is around 6 p.m. in Jerusalem. And at that time, Jesus cried for the last time, dismissed his spirit. From that moment, his body had to be removed from the cross and buried before sunset. So it all had to happen fast. And we're introduced to a rich man, Joseph of Arimathea who had been a secret disciple of Jesus. Luke 23, 50 to 52 tells us that he was a member of the Sanhedrin and had not consented to their death plans for Jesus. He had been hiding his faith, but now he comes forward. He goes to Pilate and asks for the body of Jesus. You see, the body of a criminal actually belongs to Rome to do with as they liked. He had to get permission to bury Jesus, and Pilate gave it to him. Joseph took the body of Jesus and wrapped it in strips of linen. He did not have time for all the washing and anointing that would usually happen as the body had to be buried before sunset when the Sabbath would begin. But Joseph had help from Nicodemus and they did put 75 pounds of spices on the body of Jesus. Joseph laid the body of Jesus in a tomb that belonged to him, a tomb that had never been used. Did you wonder why that mattered? Well, for one thing, no one could say that anyone else had been raised from the dead out of that tomb, for there had never been another body in there. And, never, and, and also, it fulfilled the passage of Psalm 49.9, which says that his body would not see decay. He would not be, even be in the presence of previous decay. The burial of Jesus the act of doing it made Joseph ceremonially unclean. He would not be able to celebrate Passover on the Sabbath, but he did what he could for the one he had chosen to love and in whom he had put his faith. He then rolled a large stone over the doorway of the tomb and went away, leaving the Son of God there over the Sabbath. The women who had been at the cross sat nearby, having followed to see where he was buried. They intended to come as soon as the Sabbath was over to anoint the body of Jesus for themselves and to mourn. Verse 62 says, the next day. Now this would be the Sabbath, Saturday. The religious leaders are too frightened of Jesus to simply enjoy the Sabbath. And they go to Pilate, verse 63. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples might come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. So Pilate gave them what he wanted, and he allowed them to make the tomb of Jesus as secure as they possibly could. They put a seal on it, 
an official seal so that it was a major criminal offense to open it, and they set a guard. Now the tomb was as safe from tampering as they could make it. Ironically, their efforts only served to underscore that no one stole the body of Jesus. No one snuck up past a group of guards who just happened to fall asleep, rolled away a mass of stone weighing almost a ton, unwrapped the body of Jesus, and ran off into the night carrying an unclothed corpse, all without waking up the guards or being seen. That's just not possible. So their guarding proved that no one stole the body, and Jesus did not wake up, did not push away this massive stone by himself and stagger off into the night. The efforts that were taken to keep the tomb from being opened just made it all the more evident that Jesus was truly dead and truly buried. And that lays the background for what will happen on Sunday morning. The burial of Jesus confirmed that he died in full payment of the penalty of sin. Throughout his book, Matthew has asked us to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He has provided quote after quote from the Old Testament to show us that Jesus did all that had been prophesied. He told us of miracles and teaching of the power of Jesus, all to demonstrate what the centurion saw in just a few hours of observation. Surely Jesus is the Son of God. Has there been enough proof for you? You might think that the fact that this stuff is written down is not proof that it's true, but when Matthew wrote this book, Many people who were in Jerusalem for that Passover was still alive and around. This gospel was written less than 30 years after the events. If this account was not true and accurate, a record would have, uh, if, if this was not a true and accurate record of what happened, others would have written a, re, a, refute, a refuting record of these events. And no one did. Because it did get dark for three hours. There was an earthquake. Graves were opened. The temple, of the, the temple curtain was torn. All the greatest miracles still lie ahead. For this one place, the death and burial on Friday, good for this all took place, the death and burial on Friday, Good Friday. From the perspective of what it did for us, it was a terrible day in other respects, a day of darkness and suffering, of injustice and evil and pain and loss and separation and grief. But it was only Friday and Sunday's coming. 